With the multiple tours of duty many have served due to the length of the Afghan and Iraqi wars, pressure and demand has probably never been greater on our military members. One related concern is the rate of suicide among vets. Connecting Point correspondent Carolee McGrath spoke with Lee Paz and Jillian Hynek from the Veterans Administration to learn what's being done to address that serious issue for vets. So basically my job is to make sure that our veterans that are deemed at high risk for suicide um, are getting the care and support that they need. So mental health, physical health. Um, basically I do that by one-to-one -one counseling. Um, I also consult with clinicians through the, the VA um, on a daily basis. So if they're working with a veteran who's struggling with suicidal thoughts, um, guiding them through what to do at that point and to see what resources are out there for them. Um, and also a lot of training, so training our staff members um, on suicide prevention as well as coordinating with community organizations um, to get you know, our, our services out there and let people know that we are here to help. Um, another thing that I do is um, coordinate with the Veterans Crisis Line. So that's a 24-hour hotline, um, 24 hours, seven days a week. Any veteran that's in crisis can call that, and it's actually the National Suicide Hotline, so anybody can call that. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a veteran, we ask that you press one to be connected to the Veterans Crisis Line. Do you think people um, would be surprised to know the actual rate of suicide among veterans? I know that there was a, a study by the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, showing um, 20 a day and do you think that the civilian population would really understand, you know, just how big of an issue this is? You know, I think it's a huge issue. It's the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, twenty a day. Out of that twenty a day, only six of those veterans are utilizing uh, VA services. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to to get the word out there that we are there to help, okay. and we can help. And it's heartbreaking to hear a statistic like that. Here you think that you have men and women who have served our country with honor, and then they come home and they're in this situation. In your job, I know you served in Iraq uh, in the Army in 2008, and your job as transition patient advocate, you must be you know, dealing with people and trying to help them um, as they transition back into civilian life. Yeah, that's actually what my whole job is, is, is to help um Actually, it's, it's to pick up severely injured veterans from military, military treatment facilities. So Walter Reed, Bethesda, my job is to go out there and pick someone who is severely injured and transition them back home, uh, you know, seamless care, make sure that their, their appointments are filled, everything they need back here uh, that they were receiving over there is, is met. Um, but so when I'm not doing that, yeah, it's, just, it's just a matter of making sure veterans understand what they're entitled to. Uh, like Jillian said, you know, out of, would you say 20, seven of them are utilizing VA healthcare benefits. And, you know, the misconception is amongst the younger veterans anyways, coming home is, you know, it's for the old guys or, you know, um, save it for the guys that really need it. And I think when they, when they say something like that, it's, it's save it for the amputees or someone who, who you can physically see something wrong with them. Right. Um, and that's, that's the misconception. I, I go out there and let them know why they should be using it. Um, you know, not just because it's a free benefit for them that they get for five years after they get out of the military, but also uh, when they sign up, it actually, um, you know, gives more to our budget, which is, allows us to up, upgrade our equipment, mm -hmm. hire more staff. So in turn, you're really doing more for, the, for your veteran if you do sign up and utilize it. How difficult is it, though? I mean, if you were to help the layperson understand the transition coming back, uh, not just being in the military, but seeing combat as well, how difficult is that for men and women who are returning? I think it's very difficult because, so we'll go with, you know, like a combat, we'll, we'll go with a regular, you know, regular service. Like I said, there's there's rules and regulations that are to be followed. It's, it's almost a perfect world. Um, you know, there's a chain of command, it's, you, you must adhere to. Um, and then when you get out of the military, just a regular military, um, so you're dealing with that. You're dealing with a world that doesn't follow the same kind of rules. Um, so that's tough to, to try to follow, you know, adapt into civilian, civilian life. But then 
when you're in combat, there's a whole you know different set of issues that come with that, and that's you know um, what we see is that we see a lot of veterans, you know, they're in adrenaline rush almost every day, and so when they get out of the military, they're still looking for that adrenaline rush. So you go from a, an adrenaline kind of atmosphere to a slow-paced atmosphere where nothing's going on. Um, so they, they therefore look for adrenaline, and that could be in multiple um, ways, you know, driving fast, driving recklessly, uh, getting into fights, gambling, drugs, uh, just to get that adrenaline. So, I mean, it really is difficult. Plus, you don't, most people that get out of active duty, as soon as they get out of service, when you're in, when you come back from Iraq, you're normally with the guys you deployed with mm. or the women you deployed with. When you get out and you're, you know, sent back home eventually, you're no longer with anybody who can really truly understand you. You're with mother and father and brother and sister and friends who have never served. And it's hard for them uh, as civilians to understand what you just went through. And a veteran doesn't want to really explain everything because that means kind of reliving everything. So it is, it's very tough. And is that part of the difficulty in, um, in helping people, especially who have those, um, those thoughts, those suicidal thoughts of, of having them talk about it because it must be so painful and traumatic, almost reliving anything that they might have seen? Oh, it is, definitely. And I think in that moment when somebody's experiencing suicidal ideation, our job as the clinicians is basically just to calm them at that point, make sure that they're doing okay, and making sure that they're safe. That's our number one goal is making sure that they're safe. And also the suicide rate since uh, 2001 has increased uh, about 32 percent, and that was in that, that same study. Does that surprise you at all considering uh, what's happened in the last 15 years or so? It doesn't surprise me. Um... It doesn't surprise me, just because, like I said, what I just mentioned, you know, um, people are looking for that adrenaline rush, and sometimes when they get it, it could be, it could be the end of their life. Um, but I think it's, it's what really kind of doesn't shock me is, is what comes along with combat, and sometimes PTSD, most of the times, PTSD comes along with, with being in combat. Um, you have soldiers, Marines, airmen, um, who have killed people who have seen things that I don't think a lot of people can comprehend seeing. And when they come home with that and they're isolating, um, which is a symptom of PTSD, um, it's, when, you're in, when you're in your own head, it's like the worst place to be. And then you just kind of want out of it. You want to, it. When you live in your head 24-7 and you can't make anyone realize what you're going through, sometimes the easiest way um, is just to take your own life, or that's that's you feel that that's your. It's the only way you can get out of feeling how you're feeling every day. But there is help out there. So, what is your message to veterans, to their families, as well, who might be struggling with this issue? Right. So, as Lee was saying, it's a, a very hard struggle, but there is help out there. Mm -hmm. You know, the veteran um, veterans crisis line is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, Somebody is always there to help, and then you can always come to one of our, one of our community-based outpatient clinics or the main clinic in Northampton for help. Uh, we have walk-in hours, and somebody is always available to help. Okay, Jillian, thank you so much for joining us, and Lee, thank you for joining us, and thank you for your service. We really appreciate you both being here.